HRC Law Class. Hope you all enjoy the day. I'm your brother Kasafo. And I'm your brother Zakwa. Praise Ahayah and our Lord Yache Christ. Hope you all have been enjoying the edification as we're learning the commandments to help us in our journey. Today, we will discuss the third commandment. Can you read Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, please? Thou shalt not take the name of Ahayah the Alahayim in vain. The word vain, 7723. It means in the sense of desolating evil as destructive, literally ruin and morally, especially guile. So we shall not take the name of Ahayah in evil or in guile. Figuratively, idolatry as false. So we can't have any falsehoods with the name of Ahayah. Uselessness as deceptive, objectively, also and verbally in vain. False, falsely, lie, lying, vain, vanity. So when we take the name of Ahaya, we can't be in any falsehoods, idolatry, lies, or vain thing. His name is holy. Can you read Psalms 99 verse 3, please? Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. His name truly is great as it keeps those who belong to Christ in one with his spirit and amongst each other. Can you read John chapter 17, verse 11, please? And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. See, it's through his name that we are being made one and kept. Thus, his name brings oneness and no divisions. And we're going to get understanding of this even through the law and the Hebrew language. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, please? Hear, O Israel, Ahiah or Alahayim, it's one Ahiah. And the Hebrew language, we're going to go into it to understand how he is one himself as he brings oneness through his name. This phrase in Hebrew is Chema Echere Allah, Ahaya, Alahaya Noah, Ahaya, Al Kada. The word we want to focus on specifically is Al Kada. That's the word for one. In H259, the word Al Kada means properly united, that is one. Or as an ordinal first, also together. The word akadu is a sentence in Igbo. Akadu means it is together, it is united. In common speech, Igbos would say akadu, which means it is what it is, or it is true, or it's right. Like if you ask him, like, did that really happen? Is that that is that for sure what he said? They say akadu, or they say akadi. Okay. You'll find some Igbos pronouncing it as Akaadi as well as in different dialects. But the best pronunciation according to the language from the restoring to the ancient dialect is Akaadu. The word A, if you see the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet of that word, you have the letter A being represented, the letter CH being represented, and the letter D. The CH makes a K sound in this word, just like the CH can make a K sound in English. The A letter makes a A sound in this word, as it can do in English in certain words. So A means it. Ka means together, in company with, united. What we're talking about right now is what it still means today in the Bantu dialect of Igbo to help understand how the Bantus are actually speaking Hebrew. So A means it or he, ka means together in company with, united. So you can understand that particular root word is what helps make the word akadu that you read in H259 helps it mean united. And du means be, in a state of being, exist, before, first, beforehand, or to accompany. So also du comes with uniting because they're in the company together. 
Thus, through this word, akal do. We can see that the definition in the concordance still correlates with what is being spoken in Bantu today, because Hebrew is the same language as the Bantu speak. And it helps us understand that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are united, ka, as one. They exist, which is du, and they are the first, which is du. <laughs> they are the first Alahayim that existed before all. Hence, Ahaya is called the Alahayim of Alahayims. Now, this one Alahayim is holy himself, and there is none holy as him. Can you read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, please? There is none holy as Ahaya, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our Elohim. One thing that makes him holy is that he deals truly without lies or deceit himself. Can you read prayer of Azariah, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, please? Blessed art thou, O Lord Elohim of our fathers. Thy name is worthy to be praised and glorified forevermore. For thou art righteous in all the things that thou hast done to us. Yea, true are all thy works. Thy ways are right, and all thy judgments, truth. And Nehemiah 1 and 5, please. And said, I beseech thee, O Ahiah Elohim of heaven, the great and terrible Allah, that keepeth covenant in mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. He himself lives up to his name by his true dealings to have mercy on those that love him and observe his commands and holds us accountable to love and observe his commands. Hence, he doesn't permit us to take his name in vain as it is a glorious and fearful name. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 58, please? If thou would not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, Ahaya the Alahayim. According to the holiness of his name and his own holiness that he upholds, he holds us accountable to bear his name as well. Can you read the rest of Exodus 27, please? For Ahaya would not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We are not guiltless in this faith, as it is his name that's bringing us into one spirit and body, as Christ prayed him to do. Knowing the holiness of his name, we ought not to use it lightly in any matter. Can you read Deuteronomy 23, verse 21 to 23, please? When thou shalt vow a vow unto Ahiah the Elohim, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For Ahiah the Elohim will surely require it of thee, and it will be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear the vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto Ahiah the Elohim, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. You notice, we're going to touch back to this, but notice, whatever went out of his mouth was a promise. We're going to get back to that when we understand the Hebrew language a little better. The vows can lead to our hurt, so the Lord commands us not to swear at all to help us. Can you read Matthew 5, verse 33 to 37, please? Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto Ahaya thy oaths. That's a dunny end. So. <laughs> but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is Elohim's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So we don't make promises or oaths, but we just deal truly 
and let our yes be yes and do what we said we would do. We were created to be honest and people of our word like the angels. Can you read Enoch chapter 69 verse 8 and then verse 9 to looks like 10, please. Uh, Enoch 69 and 8. And the fourth was named Penemuel. And he instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper, and thereby many sin from eternity to eternity and until this day. For men were not created for such a purpose to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. For men were created exactly like the angels, to the intent that they should continue pure and righteous, and death, which destroys everything, could not have taken hold of them. But through this, their knowledge, they are perishing. So you can understand, that's why Yahche, as he came to fulfill and restore all things and give us true understanding, to know why he said, yea, be yea, and nay, be nay, that's what we're supposed to do from the beginning, be men of our word. Okay. Thus, Christ is restoring us back to our pure nature to speak and deal truly without pronouncing oaths or making contracts to do so. Yet, in the world, idolatry has led to lightly forswaying ourselves and lying. So, we have to make contracts in the world today as needed to hold everyone accountable to their words. The interesting thing about what Christ taught is that our words are already an oath when we speak. So there is truly no need to swear or make promises because we are already accountable for the words that we speak. Can you read Matthew 12, verse 35 to 37, please? A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words shalt thou be condemned. This understanding is gathered or further will help us to know the importance of our words and how to choose our words wisely. When we look at the Hebrew word for speaking or saying something, the word in H559, the word is amaro. It's a primitive root, but we're going to get in a little later into the roots of this root in the Bantu languages because they're speaking Hebrew. It means to say, use with great latitude, answer, avouch, both self, determine, consider, declare, intend, promise. Publish. And the Browns Briggs definition means to say, speak, utter, to answer, to say in one's heart. So it's not just what we say outwardly, to say in one's heart, to think, to command, to promise, to intend, to boast, to act proudly, to avouch, or to avow. <clears throat> so Remember, things uttered in Hebrew don't have the same force, meaning when translated into another language. So from the Hebrew language speaking, what we say means a lot more than just words. And what we speak is already making a promise. So when we say yes or no, it's enough to be accountable for what we say we will do. Hence, we have to avoid hastiness to speak, lest we set a stumbling block for ourselves as what we say we must do. Can you read Sirach 4 and 29, please? Be not hasty in thy tongue, and in thy deed slack and remiss. This we ought to take heed to as every word we speak we are accountable for. So being a person that talks good and doesn't do, or says things hastily but is slack to fulfill them, is not helping us attain unto the justification we seek through faith. Now, remember the word amaro also means to boast self or act proudly, right? Let's get some understanding of that aspect. Can you read James chapter 4, verse 13 through 16, please? Go to now, ye that say, 
Today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. And we see it's boasting to just speak of what we're going to do and what's about to come to pass as if we actually know our life. Understand that Allah Hayyam's will is done daily and we don't always know what that is. So it's a proud thing to speak on what we're going to do as if we are a Allah Hayyam. But rather, it's wise to say, if the Lord wills, we shall do such and such so that we would not be speaking unwisely or making ourselves accountable to something we can't fulfill. Can you read James 4 and 15, please? For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live to do this or that. Thus is our manner of speech, not to offend Allah Hayyam by staying in line with him from any falsehood to say we will do something and not do it, which would make us a liar because our words were not fulfilled, and thus profane his name that we are called by. Can you read Leviticus 19 and 12, please? And ye shall not swear by my name falsely. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy Elohim. I am Ahaya. Now before I continue, touch on this word, Amaro. I apologize, I didn't realize I skipped it. Sorry. The concordance said Amaro was a primitive root, but to help understand and see that the Bantu are actually speaking Hebrew, you can break down the roots of this primitive root in the Bantu language. The root word of Amaro is still in the Bantu language today. The word Amma. That's the first two letters of that word. Amma. In Igbo today, it means witness, testimony, testify, avouch evidence or to divulge a secret so it still retain that meaning of a vouching or giving a witness or a testimony when we speak the word still had its meanings from the ancient times of creation unto this day in the Igbo dialect and it's interesting that ama means to divulge a secret because your words that you speak tell what is secretly in your heart as yache said out of the abundance of the heart men speak now, Amaro also means think, determine, consider, which derives from the root word, the ro, which is still a root word in Yoruba, and ro means to think, speculate, thought, consider, feel, which helps us understand that what we speak is evidence of what we are thinking in our hearts. Hence, if we speak evil things, it's a testimony that the thoughts of our heart are evil because we're speaking based on how we feel. It's just for a little understanding of how the Hebrew language really does have more meaning when spoken in its own language and understanding it, All right? So simplicity of the law for us, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Make sure we don't get caught up in any emotion or hastiness to speak without understanding and know what we're getting ourselves involved in by what we speak. Well, we're examining your heart before you speak. For sure. But that <laughs> actually, thank you. Bring it well, back. Dial it all the way back. <laughs> Check our heart. <laughs> Be swift to listen. <laughs> slow to speak. Slow well, to write. All right. Yeah, get to that silence of purity of heart before saying anything. All right, don't let the devil get us in trouble with hastiness to utter conceit in our heart, okay? Actually, now i got to go to that precept. Because that's important. In the Surat 27 and 6 says, The fruit declareth if the tree have been dressed. So you can tell how well a tree is taken care of by the fruit. So is the utterance of a conceit in the heart of man. So we can tell how well we're on guard and 
being attentive to ourselves by what conceits are uttered in our hearts. Right? Got to catch that. The heart, so it does not bring forth evil fruit. Mm -hmm. Right for that. This is all to help us not take his name in vain. Right? Remember, our trust is in the holy and true Allah Hayyam. So we can't just lightly say we would do things, which is a promise, as we're now learning once we speak, we've made a, a vouchment, we promise to say we would do something, and not do it thinking we won't be hurt, because that's how idolaters operate and think. Can you read Wisdom, Solomon chapter 14, verse 27 and 29, please? For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. For either they were mad when they be merry, or prophesy lies, or live unjustly, or else lightly forswear themselves. For insomuch as their trust is in idols which have no life, though they swear falsely, yet they look not to be hurt. Thus, if we find we say and we don't do, or are quick to speak about doing something, but we don't follow through as we aren't taking our words serious out of that lack of fear for being hurt. It lets us know we have idols in our hearts and not Ahaya, the holy Allah I am, because we are taking his name in vain when operating like that. Now touching further on how we operate being hypocrites to speak of doing right, but not doing it ourselves also blasphemes Allah Hayyam, as we are taking his name in vain, not holding ourselves accountable to deal truly and do as we say. Can you read Romans chapter 2, verse 17 to 24, please? Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and maketh thy boast of Allah Hayyam, and knoweth his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. Notice, he's self-confident, as if he has apprehended uh, or was already perfect because he knows the information about what Allah Hayyam will is in his commandments, reading out of the law. All right. Continue, please. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teacheth another, teacheth thou not thyself? His downfall was he gloried in the information to have it, to tell someone else what to do. But he didn't hold himself to the same accountability to do the same because his righteousness wasn't about his own actions being lawful, but about what he knew so he could have the glory over someone else to correct them or well, seem like he was righteous by the info he would share, though his walk doesn't live up to what he talks of in righteousness. Continue, please. Thou that preacheth the man should not steal, doeth thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, doeth thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorreth idols, doeth thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonoreth thou Elohim? For the name of Elohim is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. And thus we see, boasting of the law and not keeping it, it's a dishonor to Allah I am every time, right? We're taking his name in vain to say and not do. And knowing this, let's read Second Clement chapter 13, verse 1 for guidance, please. Therefore, brethren, let us repent forthwith. Step one. If we see we've been taking Allah I am's name in vain and blaspheming him, let's repent truly and make changes. And you have the lesson, the focus for the kingdom, for a good understanding of repentance and the work it takes. Okay, continue, please. 
Let us be sober unto that which is good. Let us be sober to take this walk serious, knowing that we will be hurt if we do not fulfill the duty of man to keep the commandments. All right. Well, we are full of much folly and wickedness. We got to be honest to see that truth within ourselves, to truly repent and start taking the necessary steps to overcome it with wisdom. Continue, please. Let us wipe away from us our former sins, and let us not be found to be men pleasers. That's humility. To turn from seeking to please men, causing us to error. Instead, we would turn to focusing on pleasing Allah by obedience and true dealings, being our true selves, as we talked about in the focus for the kingdom lesson, being our true selves, not worrying about what men think, but looking at toward Allah and worrying about what he thinks and knowing that he sees us and we need to be true in all our dealings because he does not deal in vanity or lies or any falsehood. Continue, please. Neither let us desire to please one another only, but also those men that are without by our righteousness, that the name be not blasphemed by reason of us. Let us not be partial, only walking and professing holiness amongst the church body, but also being the same person when in the world, because that, though people might not like it or be offended by it, we're actually doing it to please them by our righteousness, because people need an example to know there's another way, right? And to have charity seeking after, after his own. So by doing right and being that one person that's seeking after Allah at all times, you're actually showing love to people, okay? Continue in verse two, please. For the Lord saith, Every way my name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. And again, woe unto him by reason of whom my name is blasphemed. Wherein is it blasphemed? And that ye do not do the things which I desire. And he said, we blaspheme that we don't do the things which he desires. So this goes back to what Zachwa had touched on about that contentment with Allah Hayyam's will and contentment with Allah Hayyam in everything so that we is one desire in us his his law his fruits so that no desire of our own keeps us from pleasing him all right so a lesson I was in oh sorry that was in the focus for the kingdom lesson Continue, please. For the Gentiles, when they hear from our mouth the oracles of Allah, marvel at them for their beauty and greatness. Then when they discover that our works are not worthy of the words which we speak, forthwith they betake themselves to blasphemy, saying that this is an idle story and a delusion. Take in the name of Ahaya in vain. When they see what we're doing doesn't live up to what we're talking, they know. Well, they take the gospel, the law and the testimonies as idle tales. And we cause them to blaspheme. So you can see the simplicity of that commandment not to take his name in vain is not just for our sake, but it's for others also. All right. When they hear from us that Allah saith, it is no thank unto you, if ye love them that love you, but this is thank unto you, if ye love your enemies and them that hate you. When they hear these things, I say, they marvel at their exceeding goodness, but when they see that we not only do not love us, they laugh us to scorn, and the name is blasphemed. So they can see that we don't even love ourselves. They see us not getting along. They see the seditions. The divisions in the body. All right. 
this ties back to the lesson focus for the kingdom we need to be on one we need to be of one mind minding the same thing bring these two lessons together because we have that name ahaya our allah i am that's one we actually have to be one on the same mind the same doctrine in every respect of doctrine so that <clears throat> the name of Allah Hayyam isn't blasphemed. That goes into flee from partiality lesson two. One doctrine. So hopefully this helped in bringing things together, understand us and learning these laws and getting on the same page and keeping them is not only for our salvation, but also to be a light some to the world so that other people can come to know Christ too. All right. Continue, please. Second Clement 14 and 1. Wherefore, brethren, if we do the will of Allah and our Father, we shall be of the first church, which is spiritual, which is created before the sun and the moon. But if we do not the will of the Lord, we shall be of the scripture that saith, my house was made a den of robbers. So therefore, let us choose rather to be the church of life that we may be saved. Amen. Amen. Let's not be robbers. Remember the simplicity for us from the last lesson on focus on the kingdom is Allah gave us all his spirit to bring back pure. Let's not be found robbers to deal in any lies, but to be true in all things. And that we will also keep this commandment not to take his name in vain by being true and accountable as he is to exemplify the name of Allah Hayyam and help the name of Allah Hayyam bring us all into one in truth, a part of this church, which is spiritual, that we may be saved. And with that, hope this is helpful. Anything else, Brother Zachary? Nope. All good. Praise Allah Hayyam. All right. Be sure to check out the website. Visit us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Check out Zachwa. Did it again on TikTok. Some good edification on there. And also Hebrew Readers Church on TikTok. And uh, our website is HebrewReaders.com. Any questions, comments, or just to let us know how you're doing. Give us a shout on any comment, whichever platform you find us on, and or shoot us an email at HebrewReaders at gmail.com. And with that, catch you on the next one. Peace. HRC, 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 HRC,